Welcome to our audience to this uh, Euro webinar in collaboration with uh, IRUS and the European School of Urology. Today we are here with uh, uh, Dr. Aldo Bocciardi from uh, Niguarda Hospital in Milan and Dr. Karen Francis from the University of Antwerp. Uh, the topic is uh, retus bearing prostatectomy with robotic approach. And uh, so welcome to this webinar. Let me just share some slides. So um, I would like, first of all, to thank very much uh, Intuitive for the educational grant of uh, this webinar. Uh, this is uh, our uh, <clears throat> webinar schedule, about 10 minutes per presenters. The questions can be asked through the question portal, so we will read them and uh, we will report them to our speakers. And uh, you don't have to forget that this webinar is accredited with one European CME credit. So what is the program today? We have a uh, retrospering prostatectomy technical tips from uh, Dr. Mocciardi, retrospering prostatectomy scientific evidence from Dr. Francis, then we will have a challenging lecture, results in iris disease, and then why I do it, why I don't do it. I think we will cover these very interesting topics. Uh, Aldo always says that uh, he does the prostatectomy through the right way, whereas the anterior approach can be the wrong. So we'll see if he is right or not. And uh, I think we will have a lot to discuss about this very interesting approach that is spreading around the world and uh, I think we will have a, a lot to discuss. So uh, let me say thanks again to European Association of Urology and uh, all the organization that has been behind this, uh, this webinar. Aldo, please, let's start with your, yeah. with your talk. Okay, so the video, then we can uh, start with the video. Dear colleagues, I'm honored to take part in this meeting. I'm excited to talk about the Eretzia sparing technique, which was conceived and developed by me in 2010. This technique is young compared with the anterior method universally performed until the birth of the Eretzia sparing approach. The diffusion of the Eretzia sparing technique has grown rapidly uh, there are many works in the literature that consolidate the results and the advantages of this approach. The centers all over the world where it is performed are constantly growing. Furthermore, those who begin to perform it no longer return to the anterior approach. But why is it spreading? What are its benefits? To answer these questions, we must consider the anatomical field where prostatectomy is performed and the structures that are injured during anterior surgery. With retzia sparing, these structures are preserved. First of all, the bladder is not mobilized. As highlighted in this work, continence is reached after one week by patients treated with the retzia sparing approach, thanks to a lower descent of the bladder neck compared with what occurs through the anterior route. In addition, many other structures are preserved with the retzia sparing approach. The endopelvic fascia, the pubic prostatic ligaments, the Santorini plexus, the patel artery. With the retzia sparing technique, true full nerve sparing can also be performed at 360 degrees. The saving of all these structures determines excellent functional results, mostly in terms of immediate continence. This is the best known advantage of the Retzius sparing approach. As our data show, continence one week after surgery is achieved in 85% of patients overall, rising to 90% in cases where full nerve sparing prostatectomy is performed. I must also underline that oncological results and potency recovery are absolutely comparable with anterior prostatectomy. It's natural to ask whether the procedure and the results are reproducible. 
The answer is yes. The technique is in fact standardized and there is a protocol for the execution of, of each single step designed to optimize the procedure and make it easily reproducible. There are also a number of tips and tricks that can make Retzius sparing RARP easier to carry out. The patient is placed in the lithotomy position and in a 30 degree Trendelenburg position. There is a particular configuration of the robotic arms with the second robotic arm being placed on the left side. A 30 degree optic lens is used and is rotated several times during surgery using its angle to optimize surgical vision. Compared to the anterior technique, some modifications are also necessary regarding the positioning of the trochas. The optic is placed close to the umbilicus on its right side. The second robotic arm is placed two fingers above the umbilicus and four fingers laterally from the umbilicus. Into that trochar is inserted a cadia forceps. The third robotic arm is placed two fingers from the left superior iliac spine. Into that trochar is inserted a Maryland bipolar forceps. The first robotic arm is placed on the right side of the patient in the middle of an imaginary line connecting the umbilicus and right superior iliac spine. Into that trochar is placed a monopolar scissor or a needle holder depending on the step that the surgeon is performing. The first assistance port is placed two fingers above the right superior iliac spine. Using that port, the assistant can place clips or insert a grasp or a scissor to cut the stitches. The second assistance port is placed on the right side, almost symmetrically to the second robotic trocar. Into that trocar is placed a suction and irrigation device. At the end of the procedure, a suprapubic tube is placed two fingers above the pubic bone. The urethral catheter is subsequently removed. We have demonstrated that the suprapubic tube is better tolerated by patients compared to the classic urethral catheter. Another tip is the positioning of a stitch, the so-called pansadoro stitch, in one epiploon to retract the bowel to gain space into the Douglas. After seminal vesicle isolation, we insert two transabdominal stitches to open the surgical field and suspend the bladder. <coughs> two absorbable stitches, respectively at 6 and 12 o'clock, are placed on the bladder neck once isolated. Their purpose is to help with the identification of the bladder neck during anastomosis. Anastomosis is performed with two V-lock stitches using a modified Van Velthoven technique. Each decoded step and each trick is advantageous as regards execution of the technique. The Retzius sparing approach is a faster procedure than the anterior approach with less blood loss and a lower risk of inguinal hernias. Anyone and everyone can do it. Well, thank you very much, Aldo. Do you have any comments before moving to Karen talk on uh, the video? I think it's very clear for the beginning. Uh, it's not difficult. It's a very simple position and uh, it's a very safe procedure. I'm very happy for the results. Karen, what do you think about yeah, I totally you are, agree. You are, you are one of the, of the first followers. <laughs> I'm a big fan. <laughs> okay, so we covered the technical tips uh, from, I uh, would say, uh, for the beginner and for also for the experience. I would move to the scientific evidence to try to see if this novel technique has a, an evidence-based support. And uh, then we will see specific cases like, as we said before, high-risk disease, and then 
uh, the surgical preferences with the other two talks. So Karen, let us know if there is evidence supporting this technique against or pro. Okay. So first of all, my conflict of interest, uh, well, I'm a robotic surgeon and I'm only performing rats sparing uh, route technique uh, since the day that we started. So since uh, March, 2016. Um, so the technique was invented and developed as we all know by Dr. Aldo Bocciardi from Milan. And the technique was first described in 2010 by uh, the team of Dr. Bocciardi, by, by Galfano et al. in the European Urology. And then there was, it was followed by a second publication in 2013 by the same group, uh, where they were uh, publishing about the results of their first 200 cases. The statement, as we already heard about this technique, uh, is that compared to the conventional whelp, it results in superior early continence rates and equivalent oncologic efficacy. When we do a scientific search, uh, combining the words uh, ratios and sparing and radical prostatectomies, we will find more than 90 papers uh, about ratios sparing whelp. So there has been quite some publications uh, since the first publications in 2010 and 2013. There were four meta-analyses, one from Yang, Tsai, Fukan, and Tsu. There were three systematic reviews from Albicini, Chikuchi, and Davis. And there is one Cochrane review from Rosenberg. I would like to discuss uh, with you uh, the most recent meta-analysis, and this is actually uh, the most up-to-date and the most comprehensive uh, meta-analysis uh, by Tsu et al. And just recently uh, published in the Frontiers of Surgery in September 2021. It is the most comprehensive uh, due to the inclusion of several uh, recent so recently published in 2020 and 2021 high-quality works. And due to this, they obtained actually more stable uh, results um, that were sometimes even different uh, than the previous meta-analysis. The, the, they included 14 studies uh, for uh, randomized controlled trials and all uh, other studies were observational controlled uh, trials. The follow-up, uh, was 12 months up to 24 months. So here you can see the 14 studies that were included. What did they show about the oncological uh, results? Uh, well, it showed no significant difference in positive section margin rates, uh, also not when there was uh, made a differentiation for pathological stage. There was although significantly higher a positive section margin rate in the anterior side um, with that's just sparing route, and no significant difference in one year by chemical recurrence rate. For the functional uh, results, uh, we see the forest plot of postoperative uh, continents um, definitely uh, and clearly in favor of the ratios sparing uh, route. So they show that for the post-operative continents, uh, this was significantly better in the ratio sparing route. And this was uh, the, so at one month uh, post-operatively, but also at three months, but is also continued at six months and even at 12 months. And actually we can uh, state that every paper confirms the functional superiority of the ratio sparing route in terms of continence rates. At four up to six weeks postoperatively, there is a continence rate of 45 uh, upon 90% for dressy sparing whelp um, and 9% up to 50% for the conventional whelp. So in conclusion, we might say that there really is a growing scientific evidence for the use of the ratio sparing route technique, uh, but also a growing evidence for the superior functional results of this technique and the equivalent oncological effect efficacy from the ratio sparing route technique. 
We must also uh, do add a critical note. Uh, in all those papers, there is a lack of long-term results and especially a lack of long-term oncological follow-up. Uh, the the follow-up is mostly 12 up to 18 months. So we need also uh, papers uh, reporting about a longer uh, follow-up. And we also need more studies uh, that are focused on high-risk prostate cancer because not all studies included high-risk prostate cancer. And when they did, um, uh, the, the group of the high-risk prostate cancer was always the smallest. So we need some more um, uh, results or uh, publications about the high risk. Uh, but that's uh, what uh, Aldo is going uh, to talk about in the next topic. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. Aldo, are, yeah. you, are you with us? So uh, before going ahead, I have some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, what's the learning curve for this procedure? I would like to ask both of you because Aldo is, invented this technique, uh, Karen adopted in this daily practice. So we might have two different uh, answers. What do you think yeah. what's the learning curve? Well, there are already also some publications about uh, the learning curve. We participated in uh, the uh, publication in the British Journal of Urology coordinated by the group of uh, ALDO. And there were 14 participants uh, from three continents. And there we, we showed that 50 cases was not completely enough to lower the positive section margin. So probably the learning curve is in between 50 and 100 cases, and it's more or less comparable uh, with uh, the conventional um, route. And I think for us, we also clearly showed that after 100 cases, uh, our positive section margins uh, were clearly going down. And what is the benefit uh, uh, of placing two working trockers on the left of the camera, what instruments do you place in the left side, Aldo? On the left side, I have a, 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 a Cadier forcep uh, and uh, a Maryland. But it is my habit. I mean, I don't think that it changes a lot. Uh, about learning curve, uh, Bernardo, I say something because it depends a lot from the experience of the patient and the, the number of uh, in, uh, intervention uh, I think that the high volume is uh, really necessary to learn the surgery in a, in a new way uh, very fast. Uh, but that is obvious. Uh, I think that depends from the experience of the surgeons, the number of, pro of procedures that they can do, and uh, um, the skill of the surgeon. That is something that is not uh, available, uh, in my opinion. But... Uh, uh, it's not difficult that you think it all my assistant to do that uh, with the beautiful result. Huh? Yeah. So would you suggest for a lefty to invert the position of the trocker and put them on the right side? Because uh, the description of the video, it was stressed that it was good to have them on the left, but it's just a matter of preference of the surgeon, I guess. Yes, but if, if the grasp, uh, the, the, the cadet force is only... Um, uh, use is to pull up the prostate and the seminal vesicle, uh, but I use the, 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 the for, for the, the suture for the, the anastomosis, so but depends from the habit and the, uh, of each surgeon. So, Fernando asks, How is good technique compared to red space sparing? Ex functional and oncological outcome. I guess that he meant. Uh, compared to the traditional approach, how this makes a difference in terms of functional and oncological outcome. And I guess that both talks uh, are focusing the advantage of red sparing on uh, uh, early recovery of continence and the equivalent oncological outcome. Then I have Patricio Cruz that is asking, is it also a good option for cases with lymph nadenectomy? And we know that there are some reports that might include um, increase the risk of lymphocyte. What do you think about? Lymph node dissection can be done or cannot be done? Yeah, the, 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 the lympho cell depends from the lymphodenectomy, not from the operation. But, uh, I think there is no difference. The lymphocyte is something that happens to every surgeon. 
and uh, we tried a lot of uh, trick to try to reduce that. At uh, that moment, we tried to take the peritoneum on the vessels open with two uh, clips, uh, but it, some just a little better, but not a lot. I think uh, it depends from uh, the lymphadenectomy that we do uh, in some case uh, an extended lymphadenectomy. Karen, Patricio is still asking, do you recommend it for laparoscopic procedures? What do you think, Karen? Well, I think it's very difficult for a laparoscopic uh, procedure uh, because also of the 30 degrees up and down and, and the, 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 the small limited space, I think it's, it's typically a robotic uh, technique probably. It's not feasible in open surgery, but I think it will be very, very difficult laparoscopically. And so you replied also to the further question because uh, Karim Aram is asking, does it feasible through open route as there is no robot in our country? And I guess that uh, one of the big advantage of robotics beyond all the others is that this approaches like red to sparing approach or Bocciardi technique can be done only robotically. And uh, I think that this has to be pointed out. So uh, we have a lot of uh, questions, a, a lot of interaction with our audience. I would like to thank them very much. But I think that now we can move on with uh, Aldo's next talk that I think is one of the key because uh, all the detractors of this technique say, but it's not feasible for high risk. All the supporters say it does not, not make any difference. You can do high risk prostatectomy also with a risk to sparing. So what is Aldo's answer on this kind of uh, disease? Please go ahead. About 10 years that we perform only risk to sparing in uh, in every class of risk and uh, in any condition. I, I think that they don't remember how to perform an anterior approach, but uh, uh, I will show you something and the results about high risk uh, radical prostatectomy. I think that okay, we can, uh, if you agree. Okay, we can uh, move with the second movie. Now let's turn our attention to high-risk patients. Despite the outstanding functional and oncological outcomes of the posterior approach and the inclusion of retziosparing RARP in the EAU guidelines, some clinicians are skeptical regarding the possible role of the posterior approach in high-risk prostate cancer settings, given the lack of important evidence on this subset of patients and with some concerns that retzia sparing may confer an increased positive surgical margin rate. Indeed, most available studies on retzia sparing focus exclusively on low and intermediate risk prostate cancer. High risk prostate cancer patients are generally underrepresented and their oncological and functional outcomes are generally clustered with those patients with less aggressive disease. To date, only one study published by Hohenfellner exclusively focuses on a cohort of high-risk prostate cancer patients treated with the Retzius sparing approach. Two other studies performed a sub-analysis in this subset of patients treated with Retzius sparing. These reports are, however, limited by their small sample size, short follow-up, and the absence of standardized methodology to report complications as proposed by European Association of Urology Guidelines. Therefore, the feasibility and safety profile of retzia sparing in high-risk prostate cancer patients in terms of oncological and functional outcomes and post-operative complications have not yet been closely examined to overcome these issues at the EAU and AUA Congresses, we recently presented the largest series of high-risk prostate cancer patients treated with retziosparing robot-assisted radical prostatectomy at my centre, Niguarda Hospital, which is a high-volume centre in Milan, between 2011 and 2020. We reported perioperative intermediate-term oncological and functional outcomes. Overall, 340 patients with high-risk disease were treated using our approach. 
all patients received pelvic lymph node dissection and 61.5% underwent a bilateral extrafacial approach. Positive surgical margins were noted in 28.8% of patients. Of those, 9.4% were focal, while 19.4% were extended. The rate of positive surgical margins is in line with those reported by the largest available series on D'Amico high-risk prostate cancer patients treated with anterior robot-assisted radical prostatectomy at tertiary care referral centers. Positive surgical margin rates range between 25.3% and 34.8%. The rate of positive surgical margins on the largest cohort of high-risk patients, namely 1,110, treated with anterior robot-assisted radical prostatectomy presented by Abdallah et al. is 34.8%. When we attempted to identify the predictors of positive surgical margins, we also observed that patients with enlarged prostates harboring an ISUP 4 to 5 grade group at biopsy had a higher risk of positive surgical margins at final pathology. Notably, patients who underwent bilateral extrafacial dissection who did not receive bladder neck preservation respectively showed 40% and 60% less risk of harboring positive surgical margins at final pathology. The latter findings strongly suggest that surgeons performing retzia-sparing robot-assisted radical prostatectomy should remain humble before high-risk prostate cancer patients and improve surgical planning to perform a wider surgical resection. When recurrence was evaluated, we observed that four-year probabilities of freedom from biochemical recurrence was 63.6%, in line with previous studies on high-risk prostate cancer patients undergoing an anterior robotic approach. Moreover, the four-year probability of additional treatment was 56.6%. Moreover, our analyses showed that high-grade disease and positive surgical margins were independent predictors of biochemical recurrence and additional treatment use after the Retzius sparing approach. Likewise, higher pathological stage and lymph node invasion were associated with an increased risk of additional treatment after RSRARP. Knowledge of these factors may help clinicians to improve patient counselling, adopting a risk-stratified approach. Moreover, these findings suggest that high-risk patients with negative surgical margins, low-grade disease, a lower pathological stage and no lymph node invasion might be the optimal candidates for RSRARP without the need for additional treatment at intermediate-term follow-up. The safety profile of Retzius sparing in high-risk settings was also provided by the acceptable rate of intra- and post-operative complications reported. The robustness of our data is ensured by the fact that, unlike all other available studies, we relied on the standardized methodology proposed by EAU guidelines to gather post-operative complications that is known to avoid missing critical information that might lead to the underestimation of perioperative complications. Finally, we demonstrated for the first time that the functional outcomes of high-risk prostate patients treated with retzius sparing were not significantly compromised. Specifically, the immediate rate of urinary continence recovery was 53%. When functional outcomes were evaluated in the longer term, one- and two-year urinary continence recovery and sexual function recovery were respectively 84% and 85%, 43.1% and 50%. These rates are similar to those reported in the largest available series on high-risk prostate cancer patients treated with an anterior RARP approach. I will now show you a brief video to illustrate the step-by-step -step surgical technique and provide evidence that the extrafacial approach is also feasible in retzius sparing robotic-assisted radical prostatectomy. 
A 66-year-old man showed with a PSA of 14, CT3A disease at digital rectal examination and a Gleason score 4 plus 4 at prostate biopsy. MRI identified a 16 mm left Pyrads 5 lesion. Prostate volume was 40 grams. This is the 3D reconstruction to better identify the lesion for preoperative planning. Procedure is performed with a forearm Da Vinci SI surgical system with a transperitoneal approach. A 15 cm 2.0 proline ethicon straight needle is placed on the epiploic appendices from the 5 mm assistant trocar to straighten the rectum and increase the surgical field. The peritoneum is lifted with the cadier forceps and a 10 cm incision of the parietal peritoneum at the anterior surface of the Douglas pouch is performed. The vasa differentia are isolated, dissected and pulled towards the midline with the Maryland bipolar forceps to expose and isolate the seminal vesicles. On the left side, part of the denonvillias fascia and of the perirectal fat are left attached to the seminal vesicles. An extra facial dissection is partially developed from the beginning. Here you can see the levator anifacia. Two transabdominal suprapubic stitches placed by the assistant are used to lift and support the bladder and retract the seminal vesicles. The vasa differentia are lifted upwards by the cadier forceps. The DVF is incised, starting from an extrafacial layer. The dissection is carried out towards the prostatic apex. On the left side, the DVF is pushed upwards with the posterior surface of the prostate and part of the perirectal fat. Hemolock clips are placed on the prostatic pedicle and a wide extrafacial dissection is carried out on the left side. Conversely, on the right side, interfacial nerve sparing is performed in a standard fashion. The prostate is pushed downwards by the cadier forceps and the vesicoprostatic junction is identified. Thereafter, bladder neck dissection and the dissection of the anterior surface of the prostate are performed in a standard fashion. Retzius sparing robot-assisted radical prostatectomy in high-risk prostate cancer patients is associated with optimal intraoperative perioperative and postoperative outcomes. Therefore, the Retzius sparing approach should be considered a valid surgical treatment option for high-risk patients in expert hands. We can say that RSRARP is associated with faster and higher urinary continence recovery in the short term, even in a high-risk prostate cancer setting. Therefore, if we consider all of the advantages of the Retzius sparing technique, it's natural to ask, why not use it? I hope Retzius sparing prostatectomy will spread and become even more popular around the world. 
just like pizza. Thank you all for your attention. I hope we will be able to meet in person as soon as possible, perhaps in an operating room where a retzia sparing prostatectomy is being performed. That's a fantastic conclusion. I absolutely wish you that retzia sparing become as famous as pizza around the world. So I would ask Karen to move on on the fourth talk. And then we have uh, several questions coming from the audience, some uh, tough questions coming from the moderators. So the challenge will be at the end of the, of the talks uh, discussing about the resource bearing. So Karen, why I do it, why I don't do it? Okay, well, this is actually not, uh, also not such a long um, presentation because uh, yeah, uh, what I said, uh, I am um, only performing the rest of sparing technique uh, since I started with the technique. Uh, so why I do it uh, is because uh, we, I strongly believe, and we also see it in daily practice, that this technique uh, results in superior uh, early continence rates and uh, also with comparable uh, oncological results. And this is what I said, we only uh, actually perform uh, this technique for the operative treatment of uh, prostate cancer. It's rare, it happens rarely uh, that we still need to perform uh, an anterior approach. So um, I also added, uh, I also do it in cases of, uh, so in my opinion, there, there is no case uh, which is not suitable for a retzius sparing route. Um, and this, this is uh, the case for a large uh, prostate volume. Uh, it's just a little bit uh, more work, uh, but that's the same with uh, the conventional uh, route. So uh, volumes of more than 100 cc uh, are perfectly uh, feasible. Also prostates with a median lobe, uh, this is also perfectly uh, feasible and uh, might be even easier than uh, with the anterior approach. Um, at least that's, that's in my experience. Um, it's also perfectly feasible after previous prostate surgery. Um, it depends of course how extensive this previous prostate surgery was uh, th this will um, uh, define how strongly you can still uh, save or preserve the bladder neck, uh, but it's perfectly feasible. Also in the salvage uh, setting, uh, we recently uh, collaborated with uh, uh, also multi-centric uh, study, um, which was coordinated by uh, Keith Kowalczyk, and which was recently published in the Journal of uh, Urology. Um, of course, also with um, uh, Aldo Bocciardi. And uh, we had an inclusion of uh, 72 patients. Um, and in, in the conclusion, uh, there was clearly uh, a significant benefit uh, for the functional outcome for the salvage valve. And it appeared to be, be a safe and perfectly feasible procedure. Um, so also in the salvage uh, setting, I do perform a uh, retzius uh, sparing technique. Um, also in um, the obesity uh, patients, so BMI as from 30, but even uh, up to 40, uh, it might be a little bit more difficult, but also perfectly feasible. It's actually also uh, sometimes difficult uh, with the conventional uh, approach. Uh, and also uh, in, in patients who had previous rectal surgery, um, the technique is perfectly uh, feasible. So in conclusion, there is no case uh, in which I don't do it. Uh, so I think it's feasible in almost any case, and it's my personal preferred robotic technique uh, for uh, radical uh, prostatectomy. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, two out of two players that support red sparing approach without any doubt. Congratulations for your thoughts. I think it was very exhaustive and uh, uh, covered all the area of interest. Uh, our audience is um, writing several questions, so I go back to the Q&A box to address some of their questions, and then uh, we can have a further discussion between us. Um, we left our... Is there any size limitations on uh, retrospecting approach? 
process and limitation. Sorry, Bernardo, in time limitation or size? Prostate size limitation. No, we have done 300 cc. It's longer. It's, uh, you have to spend more, more time because you have to turn around the prostate, but uh, I think that uh, doesn't change the results. Filippo Turri from Modena is asking, one, medic, one technical question, how do you deal with very large median lobes? It's a very nice question. This, for median lobe, I think that the lateral approach that we use for dissecting the anterior um, structure of the prostate, it's easier and safer compared to for the posterior, for the anterior one, because you're approaching the, the median leaf node, the, the prostate on the lateral sides, you can uh, save a lot of bladder neck. And uh, um, for that reason, I can say that uh, for uh, median lobe, it's very, very rare that we can, re we might reduce the bladder neck. So I think it's easier. You, you see the, uh, the median lobe and uh, uh, it's easier to uh, avoid to, to transact the median lobe and to leave some uh, adenoma in the bladder neck. Yeah, that's also in my experience. Um... That's very interesting because it's one of the most challenging part of the, of the surgery from uh, upside down. And Athanasios asks, how do you perform their spitting? What are the landmarks? I think it's not a very easy question to answer so quickly. So, so yeah, guys, what are the simple. landmarks for nerve spitting? It's very simple. At the beginning, when we uh, transact the uh, denubia fascia, uh, on, the, on the posterior part of the prostate, the fascia are not sticky and uh, glued together. So on the posterior part, it's very easy to, uh, to view the, uh, to decide to make an intrafascial, interfascial, extrafascial, very, very simple. And that makes you sure to follow a, a, a right, uh, a right uh, level of uh, dissection. Is but there any uh, uh, the, the ch choice to decide from the posterior part incision what level you will follow? Is there any risk of a bladder atony or basically a bladder denervation with your approach? <laughs> you know that, that I think that uh, we had uh, always uh, uh, thought uh, to uh, a lot of things, uh, the use of uh, uh, energy, but we never talk uh, about uh, the uh, vascularization of the bundle. So I think that uh, the little advantage that we have that we close the vessels only the little vessel that enter in the prostate. We had uh, a lot of experience of embolization of the prostate and we have a, um, a large anatomy of vascularization. The vascularization is uh, uh, absolutely anarchic. Quindi, I think that uh, sometimes we close some vessels that make uh, a problem uh, more than uh, uh, use the uh, the energy, but you don't you don't see the nerves. The certain nerves are completely at the other side of your uh, cock of the prostate. Actually, also when we perform a totally intrafascial uh, dissection, uh, I, I almost never put clips. I just do a little pinpoint coagulation, and you can just swipe it off. So it's not even necessary to put hemolock or clips. Uh, so you can also it's very good for the vascularity. So one question from the moderator: Why do you decide? Did you decide to develop this technique, Aldo? Yeah, I started with the uh, Monsuri approach. And when you dissect the seminal vesicle, as you know, uh, you have the prostate in front of you. So I thought, uh, and I said to Dr. Galfano that was with me, uh, why we have to dissect everything around and go um, in anterior approach when we have the prostate here. So I, I thought as you, you we, we had uh, a lot of trick about, you know, uh, Bernardo. It's easier and uh, you lose uh, less time. But uh, the idea was uh, born uh, just uh, seeing the prostate in front of me. Absolutely. And uh, let me make another question why other questions are coming from the audience. 
Uh, we know a lot about the potential of this technique on earlier continence recovery. But according to the anatomical description, basically the uh, descriptions of the presence of nerves all around the prostate, one could expect to have also an advantage in terms of uh, earlier or better recovery of potency. I have never heard about the technique that rates of spelling is better in uh, uh, potency recovery. How do you explain the fact that you are preserving I would say all the nerves around the prostate and you don't have advantage compared to the regular techniques. Yeah, but I do, I think uh, there is a, an advantage, but until now, there were not uh, good quality studies. It was not registered. So we, we do need uh, studies focusing on that. And then uh, already theoretically, uh, there, there normally there would be a benefit because of a better preservation of all uh, the nerves, like you say. But we don't have, like in a lot of uh, studies, uh, the erectile function uh, preoperative was not uh, uh, this, uh, um, recorded uh, in the right way or was not recorded at all. So very heterogeneous groups, uh, so difficult to make uh, the comparison. But the, 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 there must uh, be a, a, a nice setup and then a pop, probably we can prove that also erectile function recovery is faster and might be also better. Aldo, you have a great fan supporting your technique. <laughs> You're a very lucky man. So uh, let me ask you this from the audience. It's a very challenging question for both of you. Retsu sparing or hood technique? What do you think about this comparison? I can say that uh, I think the, the, the retsu sparing is easier, easier to perform and uh, uh, easier to make an anastomosis. Um, and you respect the one third of uh, nerves on the anterior part of the prostate. Um, but the advantage uh, is not in this term. I think the advantage is not to move the bladder. This is the, the, the real uh, anatomical advantage of retro sparing. And uh, I have another question regarding the new robotic systems. We know that there is one system that was used to do red sparing, but what do you think will happen with the new systems arriving? It will be make the life easier or harder for the red sparing surgeon, uh, the new devices that are coming. Of course, it's just a forecast because I guess that you never try to do that. But what is your point of view, Karen and uh, Al, the both of you? I think you, you, you mean the, the single port? No, I'm talking about also the new system that arriving uh, on the market. Oh, what do you think? It will I be think the there is no, absolutely better. no difference because as uh, uh, Karen said before, the problem is the, the, the wrist. Uh, so every um, new uh, machine that has a good uh, movement of the wrist can... Uh, permit you to do a perfect uh, ratio sparing. There is no problem. Also with the, have you seen the you know, single port procedure? I don't know what is the, the strength of the traction of the uh, intermediate uh, arm, but it's no problem. But it's sure that it's very, very difficult to you to, to perform that with uh, uh, laparoscopy. I think it's quite, Yes, it's possible, but there is no advantage to do that. Of course. Joseph asks, what is the approximate hospital stay at the Red Susperin radical prostatectomy in your departments? I would like to know from Karen and from both Aldo if there is any difference between the two of you in terms of hospital stay. Well, in our hospital, it's two days, sometimes three days. Uh, but I think it also very much depends on the country uh, and the way insurance and healthcare works. Uh, because they, they might be able to, to leave uh, after one day. Uh, but in general, they like to stay two days and sometimes even three days. But that's the maximum three days. I agree. Also in Italy, you know, Bernardo, you have some... Uh economical uh, reason to uh, keep patient two nights, no less, no, no less. Uh, but I think that uh, it depends from the age. A young patient is not really a problem to send it home the day after surgery. 
But in the oh. United States, I think that they can uh, uh, dismiss the patient the, the day, the evening. Again, Filippo Turri asks, what do you think of an anterior approach without opening the endopelvic fascia and the posterior plane development using the 30 degrees lens up? That is basically the Patel's technique, the very latest release of the Patel's technique. Could it somehow compare? So the, the actual Patel technique with the red sparing, do you think that the outcomes can you know, be similar? That's very difficult to compare a Patel mm -hmm. A technique that uh, I think they performed the 5,000 or more uh, procedure. Uh, it's the same reason because it's difficult to compare results uh, in terms of, uh, um, of uh, um, merge, um, positive margins. Because if you think that the anterior approach is done from 30 years in a million of cases, so the experience is very wide. Um, but uh, I can say that I'm very, very happy that uh, also uh, Vipul Patel uh, starting to, to looking at the, at, the, at the posterior part of the prostate for uh, the beginning of the operation. I've seen that it changed something, not a lot, but uh, I think that uh, little by little, the attention of the posterior dissection and the choice of the level became little by little more uh, more frequent. I think that uh, uh, this is a very important point because uh, some people move to the red to sparing, some people decide to keep going with the traditional technique, but every one of us, I think that has to thank you because of the understanding of better posterior plane and starting to develop the, uh, the bundles from below. That I think is make, really make the big difference for all of us. And uh, I think that this is a big, big advantage. So um, Thank you. Uh, just to be a little bit more provocative, we know that uh, there has been released a recent Cochrane review on the rates of sparing. And the Cochrane review report that there might be advantage of earlier continence, but there might be a higher risk of positive margins. So this is the trade-off. And some people say, I would not risk to have a higher positive margins rate just to get a little bit uh, quicker continence recovery. Would, would you reply to this question? Uh, have you I'll, seen, no. sorry, sorry, Karen. Have you Go seen, it. it's, not, it's, not, it's not true because uh, it depends, uh, you, can, you cannot consider the beginning of your experience in a, in a different uh, surgery. Uh, with the experience of surgery, like uh, Karen, uh, these positive margins are the same. Uh, I think that the beginning, the, the positive margin depends also for the understaging of the of the of the diagnosis. But uh, at that level, at that uh, level of experience, I think can say that uh, I'm not worried about those uh, positive margins, not at all. Yeah, I would like to make a comment on that also. So the Cochrane uh, review was based on five studies. Uh, and so like the most recent uh, meta-analysis that I showed you were well, included 14 studies and the four randomized control trials that we have until now, they're most likely uh, to be biased, uh, biased actually by uh, selection bias, because what Aldo said, there is this um, difference in experience because when we uh, look, for example, at the randomized control trial uh, from Menon and Dalila, um, they, they compared the experience from um, a surgeon who had experience with thousands uh, of the conventional approach with just uh, uh, after 60 cases of red sea sparing approach, so uh, still in the learning curve. And sometimes also it was not a right comparison with um, the, in the red sea sparing group, for example, uh, in, in the study of Manon and Dalila, there were more PP3 uh, included in the red sea sparing group. So um, there is a tendency uh, for, for example, the randomized control trials to be biased. So uh, we must be very prudent to, to jump to, the, to that uh, conclusion. Uh, and so recently studies uh, like the study from Keith uh, Kowalsik or the study from uh, Lee et al. or the comparative pros prospective uh, study from um, Umari and, and uh, Eden and uh, so, uh, 
Makian, I, I always forget his name, but um, they they published uh, that uh, it is the experience of the surgeon that counts the most when you are very experienced. You have uh, low positive section margins, and the study from me at all was almost thousand nine hundred patients included, uh, so they had very low uh, positive section margins, and so I think these are recent updated uh, high quality uh, works. Very well uh, supported explanation. I again uh, say, Aldo, you're very lucky to have uh, people uh, that likes your technique so much and uh, know it very well. So uh, uh, another question that is very interesting. What are the advantages of a suprapubic catheter? Anastomotic stenosis, three questions mark. If no ureteral catheter is used. Do, do you use the suprapubic catheter as well, Karen? Yes, yes, always. And there were already some studies published. It was a German study which was, which was shown at EAU. Uh, and they were comparing suprapubic versus uh, just a transturetal catheter. And it is a definitely high improvement in quality of life uh, to, to start with as the patient almost doesn't bother uh, from the suprapubic tube. And also you might think, uh, I agree with that because I was afraid in the beginning also, you, you think that you need a tube through your anastomosis to prevent stenosis. But actually we, all, we don't see stenosis. In the review of our 500 patients, we had one uh, stenosis and this was probably iatrogenic. Uh, so it doesn't cause stenosis. You don't need a tube through uh, the anastomosis. And so we, yes, we always uh, use a suprapubic tube. It has another advantage that you can, without taking a risk, uh, starting from, let's say, five days postoperatively, to try to remove the catheter by just closing the tube and you, you let the patient urinate. And if he urinates without uh, uh, developing a retention, you can safely remove, uh, remove the suprapubic tube. So in this case, you can prevent this 10 or 15% of patients who will develop um, a retention when uh, you, you um, remove the catheter at five or seven days postoperatively due to still uh, edema. So it has quite a lot of benefits to use the suprapubic tube. That's very interesting uh, point. Uh, two words about uh, retral stenosis. Uh, stenosis of the anastomosis. We had only one when at uh, the beginning we used uh, a, a large three-way Foley catheter. Uh, in about 2,500 uh, prostatectomy, I had no uh, stricture of the urethra or the anastomosis because the reason is the same. There is absolutely no traction on the, on the anastomosis. So Dr. Paolo Mari, who was quoted right ahead by Karen, say, what about the learning curve in terms of numbers for an independent, well-trained, standard robotic prostatectomy surgeon? Do you have any advice how to select the patients when starting with retrospering, like PMI or an aspirin planning or whatever? Is the typical way you select the patient when you start doing new surgery, or is there any other advice that you can give to the audience? Well, first of all, I would like to advise to be well prepared. Uh, and this means if you can uh, watch videos, go on case observation. Uh, for example, it helps when, when you do a fellowship. Uh, and then when you start, uh, it's also safe, for example, to start with proctoring uh, for four or six cases. And then when you perform the cases yourself, then it also it is also beneficial to have again a proctoring after let's say 20 or 25 cases, because then you will have other questions and new questions, which can be uh, answered by uh, the proctor. And then of course, it, it will help you not to start with the most difficult cases, just normal PMIs, um, not, a, a, not a, an obese uh, patient, and maybe try to start with low and intermediate uh, risk. And I also would advise not to start with somebody who had a, have, have had a previous uh, uh, prostate surgery or something like that. You can really, in the beginning, uh, choose uh, your cases. Um, so I think that that will be um, a good thing to do. I completely agree with you, Karen. Some uh, 
proctoring for the first cases and uh, as usually uh, in a, a low risk uh, and uh, uh, patient without prostatitis in the, in the, in the story and uh, not a very large prostate. Um, medium lab, is, I think that the beginning is the uh, easy prostate uh, for beginner. Uh, it's always the same from the anterior and posterior approach. So the last questions, then uh, we are going to conclude. Uh, 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 is the suprapubic catheter a risk for tumor spillage while you do a suprapubic catheter compared to transurethral catheterization? I guess it's not a big risk of uh, tumor spillage, but uh, I just no. want to have your answer, but I think it's not a big deal from this side. Yeah. So um, we are going to conclude our session. There was full of questions from the audience and a full of a very important hints by our experts. I would like to invite all the audience to come and visit Aldo and maybe also my centers. So you can see two different techniques in Milan, but I'm happy to share with you that our government decided that the Aldo Center and my center will be the referral center for robotics here in Lombardy. I'm very proud to share this information with you and with Aldo. Aldo, I show a wonderful pizza. I'm still expecting that we go out for dinner and uh, three times happened that we missed it. So I hope that also Karen will join us. Uh, <laughs> It'll be lovely. It will be an opportunity to share some uh, nice time together in presence, even if the COVID is not uh, nice with us at the moment. So I would like also to thank very much all the organizers, the webinar, the European School of Urology, Alberto Breda and the EUROS, and uh, if there is no other questions or no other comments, I go to conclude uh, and uh, still thanks a lot. It was a very nice time with you. Have a good night. Thank you to you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Yeah, and we, we, we wait for you in Milan for a pizza, yeah. okay? <laughs> sure, that's a deal. <laughs> beautiful uh, supporter. Eh? <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.